All right. Good morning. Uh, how's everybody doing? Good. Glad to see you all here today. Passing the peace. I like it. Um, there's a. Uh, so I, I go on these. I go on these retreats every every few months um, to Chicago, and the last uh, the last morning that we're together, we uh, we make it a practice to pass the peace, and uh, and it's and it's people from all different kinds of traditions, but but most of them are kind of. Um, more high church traditions, I say it that way, um, and uh, and we walk around and and they always say peace be with you, and you say peace be with you, and uh, it's just it's it's just a really it, it really neat neat way in which um, we we get to greet one another and uh, bring in the morning together. So uh, we're in uh, Mark chapter one. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open it up to Mark chapter one, or if you don't, uh, you maybe picked up one of these Bible journals. Uh, that are in the seats. Uh, if you didn't pick up one of those, that's fine. Uh, there might be some around. From what I heard this morning from our ushers, we're running out of the Bible journals, and so I'll have to order some more, but that's a good thing, right? That's a good thing that we're running out. Pe- means people are using them and taking them, and, um, and I-, I hope they're a good, useful tool. Um, but we're in Mark chapter 1. We've, uh, we've covered 13 verses thus far in two weeks, so we're at six and a half verses a week. Uh, so I don't know how long that's going to take us to get through the whole book. That's 16 chapters long, but it's going to take a while. Uh, so, so there you go. Um, but we're in Mark chapter 1. Uh, I, I've had a couple of questions on, on are you just doing chapter 1 or you know those kinds of things. So for October, we're going to handle chapter 1. Um, and then we'll move on uh, to a practice of Jesus uh, in November uh, that Mark chapter 1 kind of ends with. And, uh, and then we'll have Christmas and we'll talk about, uh, you know, baby Jesus, if you will, uh, and, uh, and, and what, what comes at Christmas and, and Jesus' arrival. And then starting in the new year, we'll be back in Mark, uh, Mark chapter 2. Okay, so we'll be in Mark chapter 1 till the end of this month. And then we'll take a break from Mark for just a little while and then get back to Mark chapter 2. Um, but, uh, but we've covered a lot thus far. We've covered baptism. We've covered, uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit. We've covered Jesus' baptism. We've covered Jesus' temptation. I mean, it's been a lot in those 13 verses. So we've had a lot to deal with, a lot to go on. And today will be no different. We're going to look at six verses, uh, but we have a lot to cover. So, uh, so here we go. All right. Uh, starting verse 14, uh, this is what the gospel of Mark says. Now, after John was arrested... Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me. And I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending their nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with their hired servants and followed him. So here uh, we see... um, kind of Jesus' first call of discipleship and his declaration of the gospel associated to the kingdom of God. Um, but before we go, we can't, we can't go too far without noticing that John the Baptist has now been arrested, right? This guy that we've been introduced to earlier in this chapter and earlier on in this book, um, he has been arrested. Um, and there are various reasons for this arrest, but essentially he's just rubbing the wrong people the wrong way. And, uh, and so he, he gets arrested. And what this means is as long as John was preaching, as long as John was declaring repent for the kingdom is coming or the Messiah uh, is coming, like Jesus could kind of stay in the background. And yet we see when, when John is arrested, Jesus can't stay in the background. This message must continue. And so Jesus now begins his ministry at this point. And so he steps in and begins to declare the gospel of God is what uh, Mark writes here. Um, and he says, the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. 
repent and believe in the gospel. And, um, and I want to I wanna just try and make sense of this good news, because that's what gospel means. It means good news. So there's, there's good news that, that the kingdom of God is at hand. Um, and what is that, but what does that mean, right? I think we have to ask ourselves a couple things, like what is the kingdom of God first, right? And what does it mean to repent and believe in that kingdom? Why do I have to turn from my way of life? That's what repent means. Uh, it just means to turn around. And so why do I have to turn around from my way of life and believe in this good news that is the kingdom of God? And, and what, what all is that? And, and how do we make sense of that? And those kinds of things. And, and to be honest, as I was kind of studying this, I was planning on going in a different direction um, as I left my office on Thursday and had finished writing. And then like I kind of sat with it a little bit longer, and I was like, you know what, I'll preach that sermon later in Mark, um, and, um, and so, um, so I, so I kind of shifted gears this morning, uh, as I was just kind of sitting in my office and spent some time with the Spirit in silence, uh, I just felt like he was kind of nudging me to go in a different direction, so we're going to go in a different direction, so to understand, to better understand what Jesus is talking about when he's talking about the kingdom of God, okay, now, um, I, I don't know about you, uh, everybody, did, did everybody have science class growing up as a kid? I think we all did, right? Um, so, so in order to, to really truly grab a hold of this concept of the kingdom of God, I want to go back to Genesis chapter 1, okay? Genesis chapter 1 uh, is, says, the uh, very first line of Genesis chapter 1 says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now, think about this for just a second, Okay. Uh, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, if you grew up in church or you grew up like I did in church, you had an idea of what heaven meant, right? It's this eternal resting place for those who believe in Jesus where everything is great and perfect and beautiful and there's pearly gates and golden streets and all of these things, right? Like this is what you think of when you think of heaven. And, um, and then when I thought of earth, I thought of globe earth, right? Like I thought of like what you see when you walk into science class and there's that blue plastic ball sitting on somewhat of an angle that spins really fast whenever you walk past the teacher's desk to just annoy her. Uh, and so... Because uh, you would hit it every time. You would just like make that thing spin. And so whenever I thought in my mind, okay, when I read the first line of the Bible, this is what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking heavens and the earth. I'm thinking God created this place where we can all go and rest when we die, if we believe in Jesus. And, and he created this, this globe thing that we all live on that's spinning at a, like a massive speed that we can't even fathom and just doing crazy stuff and is the perfect, you know, distance from the sun in order that human life can live and survive. Like all of these things. This is what I'm thinking, right? And here's, and here's the thing that I'm trying to propose or that I'm trying to bring to the table with that is many of us. Many of us come to the Bible with preconceived notions and preconceived ideas on what the Bible is actually talking about because of how we've been raised or how we've grown up or what we have been taught. Um, and because we live in a time where the knowledge that we have far exceeds the understanding of the universe um, that these biblical writers had. Does that make all, does that, is everybody tracking with me? Right? Like, they didn't, they didn't know that there was, like, a Milky Way galaxy and thousands of other galaxies. But we do, right? Because we have the Hubble telescope. And, but they didn't, right? So when we think about the things that are written in Scripture, these are often the way that we think about them. We think about them the way in which we've been informed in a 21st century context, not in an ancient Jewish, like, context. And so what, what God is talking about here and what is being created here. Um, simply would have just been he's, he's creating the sky and the land, okay? And what you're going to see throughout the scriptures is this idea of heavens and earth referred to over and over and over and over again. And you're not just going to hear about these two dimensions, but you're also going to hear of a third dimension. 
Now, I always thought that the place that, uh, I always thought of it as kind of like a Dante's Inferno or like a Paradise Lost kind of place. Like it's at the center of the earth where it's at its core and it's all hot, molted lava, you know? Like that's what I think of when I think of hell is that it's somewhere deep beneath the earth's crust. Um, and, and yet in the Bible, there is a, there's a different dimension that's talked about as being under the earth. And it's actually the waters. Now, we're not going to get into all of the like, theology behind all of this and, and all of that kind of stuff. But I just want you to understand that there is this, like, this three-tier idea of the, the, of the universe that the Bible lays out. That uh, there is the heavens, and then there is the earth, and then there is something under the earth. Okay, And, and we have to begin to kind of wrestle with this a little bit. So to do that... We're going to jump around this morning uh, to various different texts that help us kind of see what I'm talking about so that we can grasp this um, because I don't know how many of us, I know for me, this was not something I grew up thinking when I was reading the scriptures or even that like as I read that I just picked up on. A lot of it I just kind of took for granted, all right? So let's go to Psalm 24 for just a second. Psalm 24, 1 and 2, uh, it says this, it says, the earth... So in my, in my context, growing up as a kid, the globe, right, is the Lord's and the fullness therein. And the world, the globe, again, just another word for globe, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. So you take, take your idea or my idea of the earth as a globe and he, he, so he, he takes the globe and he puts it on waters that are underneath it somewhere? What, how, do, how do we make sense of that? Let's go to uh, Psalm 104. Psalm 104. Look at the opening lines of Psalm 104. It says, Blessed, or Bless the Lord my soul, O Lord my God. You are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty, covering yourself with light as a garment, stretching out the heavens like a tent. Stretching out the heavens like the tent. So it's not, it's not heaven, right? It's not this eternal resting place, right, that I have in my mind of heaven, but it's the heavens. It's the sky. He's just talking about the sky, right? He stretches out the sky. He lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. But hold on, we just, the waters are down here, and the, you're talking about heaven, though. So it's got to be some sort of water in the sky, maybe rain. I don't, you know, maybe something like that. Maybe rain clouds. I don't know. But then he goes on, and he says, then he makes the clouds his chariot and rides on wings and wind. And so we get more of this idea of what happens in the sky and what happens in the heavens. And he makes his messenger wins his ministers a flaming fire. So he's, he's talking about this other area um, up, up there, right? Now, look at, uh, let's look at Jonah chapter 2, okay? Jonah chapter 2. Uh, Jonah chapter 2, verse 2 says, I called out to the Lord. This is Jonah. He's, he's singing a song or poem, uh, whatever, however you want to talk about it, but, but it's probably like a song or a poem uh, that he's, he's saying. He said, I called out to the Lord in my distress, and he answered me out of the belly of Sheol. Now, that word Sheol in the Hebrew is the word grave, Okay. So it's just the, that, that's just the, the verbatim English translation of the Hebrew word shoal, and it just means grave. It says, I cried out, and you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me, all the waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I again look upon your holy temple." So you think about the waters, and you think this is where Jonah is at, right? And he's calling it a grave. He's calling it the deep. He's calling it uh, the, this place that, that he's being surrounded. And ultimately, that he feels separated from God in this place. And he's looking up to, um, to the holy temple. And he goes, the waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me, weeds wrapped about my head, all at the roots of the mountains. What's at the roots of the mountains? Have you ever thought about that? 
like what is underneath the mountains? Oh my goodness. Uh, I went down to the land whose bars closed around me forever. It feels kind of like a prison. Yet you brought me, or you brought up my life from the pit, O oh my Lord. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you in your holy temple. So here's just a couple things, okay? We have this idea of the heavens and the earth. And something under the earth. And the heavens, okay, this, this is just basic uh, understanding of what we're looking at, right? Um, the heavens are, are good, right? Uh, that's where God is, right? That's where he's dwelling. And the earth is where we are, and it's what he's created, and we live there. And then there's a place somewhere else, right? Now, Get like not not trying to like determine, you know, what you should think about heaven or hell or anything like that today. That's not what we're talking about. The idea is, is just to say, look, the Bible is built on this kind of three tiered structure of where there is a place where God is and there's a place where you and I are. And then there's some place else. OK, that's just basic. All right. Now you go um, go to Exodus chapter 20. OK. Exodus chapter 20. Uh, and you, you get a command from God uh, in verse 3. He says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above. So heaven is up. All right? Think about that. Heaven above or the earth beneath the heavens or, or that is in the water under the earth. Okay, so you see this idea of how how this this is structured throughout the scripture, right? The heavens above, the earth beneath, the water below the earth. Okay, so let's get back to Mark chapter one now. Okay, so Mark chapter one, Jesus says that this is the gospel of God. That the time has been fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Now, what do we know if we've read through these Old Testament passages about what the kingdom of God is? It's the place of his holy temple. It's the place where his chambers are, are up, right? It's, it's, where he, it's where he dwells. And so what he's saying is that he, where he dwells and where he rules and where he reigns, is coming to the earth to intersect heaven and earth, to intersect his rule and dominion where it's in the heavens to also where it is now here on earth, simultaneously being joined together in Christ. Now this is, this is what's taking place, that he's coming to sit on his throne, not distant from us, but near to us. And, and in order for us to, in order for us to uh, not miss it, we must turn from our lives of giving our allegiance to far lesser things or putting other things, uh, making other things the kings of our heart or sitting on the thrones of our life. And we must let him now sit on the throne and we must believe. But this is not something that is necessarily uh, uh, overly physical. It's something that's obviously spiritual, which is why faith is so integral to this idea that Jesus is calling people to, to believe in, in something that is not just something you can easily reach out and touch or see, but that you're going to experience and that you're going to understand as you kind of go. And so you begin to kind of see this, this play out, right, um, as, you, as you go. Now, um, so, so when Jesus, he comes and he declares the kingdom of God is at hand. And then he walks up to these fishermen and he says to them, follow me. Now, you have to understand the context, okay? Follow me are like amazingly important words in, in, in this time, okay? Uh, for a young Jewish man to have a rabbi walk up to them and say, hey, follow me 
was to have a rabbi say, hey, come be my, my disciple, come be my student, come be my apprentice. What he is saying is, come be with me, become like me, so that you can do what I can do, okay? Some of you guys maybe have heard that before. Um, but, but this is what Jesus is inviting these fishermen into. He's saying, come be with me and become like me and do what I have come to do. And what does he come to do? Bring the kingdom of God. Bring the rule of God from not just being in heaven, but to the earth as well. Right? So, so he's, he's inviting them into this kingdom movement of where they are going to become this, this really unbelievable um, just story for the future of the world of where God's kingdom rules and reigns here on earth as it is in heaven. And then you think about this. You think about this is what he teaches them to pray for, right? Right? Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So this is ingrained in what he's training them to understand and what he's training them to do and what he wants them to be about, right? You go to, you go to Philippians chapter 2, um, and when you go to Philippians chapter 2, you see... Uh, Jesus talked about in a really cool way. Um, this is oftentimes seen as like a, an early church hymn or song that's sung. But in verse 6, it says, Who, though, he's talking about Jesus. Paul's talking about Jesus. says, Who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as something to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Now, this. So, so who being in the very form of God, emptied himself, becoming like humans. Where do humans live? On the earth, right? Do you see this? He's de-elevating himself. So God is here, and he's lowering himself, born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself even further. Becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Now, uh, I don't know if you guys know the Apostles' Creed, but if you know the Apostles' Creed, in the Apostles' Creed it says that he descended into hell. The idea that he descended below the earth, that's what a grave represents. That he descends below the earth. And therefore... God has highly exalted him. He's restored, right? So he's brought back into um, exaltation. So that the name of Jesus, now look at this. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow where? In heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Okay? So... Central to bringing this kingdom about so that every, everything on heaven and on earth and under the earth can proclaim the glory of God in Christ Jesus is that Jesus has to come, has to lower himself. He has to bring heaven to earth and he has to die, descend into hell in order to be restored at every name. Or every, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord. And so this is the message. This is the message that, that they're called to preach and that they're called to proclaim. And that they go out proclaiming. This is the gospel. That Jesus descended, went into hell, and came back out. And came back out for our redemption and for our hope and for our glory. This is what they're called into. It's a really, really powerful thing that Jesus says, repent and believe in. Repent and believe in. Now, what is Jesus' kingdom going to do? Right? Now, what is, what is, kingdom, what is Jesus' kingdom mission? 
He's, this, this is what the kingdom of God is about. This is the message of the kingdom of God, that God has come, that he's died on the cross for our sins, that he's descended into hell to, to, and bury our sins there and, that, and then raised up to ultimate glory, that we can have new life with him. That's the, that's the gospel of the kingdom. But what is the kingdom meant to do if that's the gospel and we take hold of that gospel? What is it meant to do? Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespass according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will. So this is his will. This is his desire. Here it is. According to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him. Where? Things in heaven and things on earth. So his whole mission, his whole mission is to unite heaven and earth through offering us redemption and forgiveness through death on the cross. It's to bring wholeness and harmony between us and God and us and all of creation. This is, this is the gospel. And what happens uh, in, in this is, uh, is something really, really cool as well. If we accept Jesus... Uh, as he comes to unite heaven and earth and unite us to God, uh, and we give our lives to him, and we choose to follow him and obey him and, uh, and, and uh, give our lives over to him, uh, we, are, we are saved. That's the terminology that we hear used in Scripture. And, uh, and what happens when we are saved is something so, so beautiful. This is, this is the hope of salvation. Are you ready? Here it is. Verse 4 of Ephesians 2. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love, which he, has, uh, which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions. So even when we were sinners, even when we were walking around like zombies, is kind of the idea here that Paul's getting to. He says, he made us alive with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Verse 6. And raised up. And raised us up with him. And seated us where? In the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So that in the coming age we might show immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward Christ Jesus. So what happens is Jesus ascends and he's in heaven. And when we are saved, the, the idea is, is that we get lesser thrones. <laughs> but we get thrones nonetheless right next to our king and our God who has brought heaven to earth. Through his gospel, we have a chance to rule and reign next to him. This is what happens. He seats us. With him in the heavenly places. Now, if you know anything about Genesis chapter 1, and you know anything about what God has called humanity to, he calls humanity to rule and have dominion over the earth. To, to make it uh, this, this flourishing place. This place uh, of, of, of beauty and creation and creativity and wonder. He's, he's, he, he's called us to rule. And, and because of sin, we've, we've given our rule over to the enemy and to the evil one. But in Christ, he restores our ability to rule and reign with him. And this is what he calls us to as his disciples when he says, follow me. He's saying, take up your mantle to rule and reign. Take up your mantle to bring my kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. And so what Jesus does when he comes proclaiming the gospel 
of God and the good news of the kingdom of God and what he does when he calls us to follow him in this mission is he calls us to carry out this idea of building his kingdom and growing his kingdom and ruling and reigning over his kingdom that all things in heaven and on earth might be united and all things in heaven and on earth and under the earth may bow and put their knee down and every tongue confess that he is Lord. That is what we've been called to, church. That is what we are called to be and what we are called to do. That is the invitation that he extends to us when he says, come be with me and come become like me and do what I do. That's what he offers. He offers this great invitation to bring heaven on earth through us, through a bunch of ordinary unschooled fools like us. But I don't know if you notice in this story, Peter and Andrew, James and John, they all have to leave something. They all have to let something go if they're going to be on mission for the kingdom, if they're going to rule and reign as they're called to. I think it's important that we don't miss that because it would, be, it would be a mistake for us to think that we can follow Jesus and, not, and it not cost us something. That he not call us to lay down something, walk away from something, to repent and believe. You know, repentance... It might be that we leave a wretched life of sin. That might be what repentance means. But it also might mean that we just simply turn from our own striving of trying to accomplish it without the grace of Jesus. Sometimes it may mean that we turn from the curses that we've lived in and that we've walked in for years. And sometimes it may just mean that we turn away from life's blessings. Sometimes it will mean that we have to turn away from false teaching and sometimes it will be that we have to resist the urge to run and turn away from good teaching that challenges us. And sometimes it will mean that we have to turn away from a job offer that offers us more money to take a job that offers us less in order to do more kingdom work. It might mean that we have to turn away from a relationship that we would be unequally yoked to someone if we were to marry them or it might mean that we turn away from an affair and work really, really hard to restore our marriage. Repentance can look a lot of different ways, but the reality is repentance is, is, is the call of Jesus to turn away from whatever it is that we're holding on to and whatever it is that's most ultimate in our life, whatever it is that we're trying to cling to, whatever it is that we're trying to uh, just, just make our lives about in order to make him and his kingdom and heaven coming to earth what our life is about. And so for us... We have to ask ourselves the question. If we don't ask ourselves the question, we may miss what God's calling us to, but, but what are we holding on to? If Jesus came right now and he said, and I think he has said, and invited us to be with him and become like him and do what he does and bring his kingdom here on earth as is in heaven, would we, would we drop it all? Would we leave whatever we're holding on to behind? That we could be a part of this uniting of all things through Christ? Or would we say, no, that cost is too much. That cost is too great. Because we're going to see as we go throughout this book... <laughs> Not everyone who gets called responds the same way. For some, the cost is too much. It would be important for us to ask ourselves, is the cost too much for us? Is the cost too much for us? Or will we do anything and everything to bring God's kingdom here? Let's pray. 
God, we love you and we thank you for just who you are and what you're doing in this place. And God, we thank you for the invitation. The invitation that you give to be a part of bringing your kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. God, I pray that we will let go of whatever we're holding on to. We'll let go of whatever it is that we are clinging to for life. We'll repent. We'll turn around and move toward the God of the universe who has moved toward us. And give our whole lives wholly to this cause. God, may we not be so stubborn as to ignore your invitation to come be with you today and tomorrow and the next day. Your invitation to be with you every day of our life. Your invitation that you'll change and transform our lives through our being and not by our doing. And the invitation that your kingdom can come here on earth through us. So God, we pray that now. Pray that we will not ignore your invitation. And that you will indeed use us to bring your kingdom here. In Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you guys to stand here in just a moment. Move to the tables around the room where we will take communion. Um, and I think, man, this is, just a, this is just a time. This is a chance for us to, to maybe turn and repent uh, again and again and again each week, rem- remembering that it's by his body broken and his blood shed that we have life and we have hope. And if he didn't come, if he didn't descend from heaven to earth, and descend into hell for us. We would have no hope. And, and, and the whole meaning of life would be off. It would all be wildly meaningless. <laughs> but because he did, it, it has a purpose. And we have a purpose. Because he did this for us. And so may we come and may we take and may we live and embrace the purpose that we have because of his blood which gives us redemption and because of his body broken which uh, is a sign of the punishment that he took upon himself that we deserve. Amen? Let's stand and take communion whenever you feel it.